Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for the opportunity to present this work today. Uh, well, virtually online uh, at the Photonics West Conference 2021. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about some work in my group where we've been uh, looking at sort of a funny photonics that is occurring at radio frequencies. So, uh, and this is actually, I'll tell you about two different approaches we have uh, for that, for extending the idea of quantized uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation down to uh, very low frequency, well, to megahertz frequencies. Uh, and uh, one of the devices that, uh, that we use for doing that is shown on this slide. So uh, first I want to give a maybe brief introduction to where, uh, where I'm at. So I'm part of the quantum nanoscience department at the, the technical, at the University, Delft University of Technology. So this is a photograph of, uh, of our campus on uh, what is a sunny day, which happens every so often. Uh, and uh, our uh, department is focused on, uh, has a focus on three uh, topics in quantum. In particular, we have a uh, focus on quantum matter, quantum sensing and quantum transduction. Uh, I also want to mention uh, that we are currently looking for staff. So if uh, we are currently hiring at both senior track and a senior level. So if you uh, yourself or maybe someone you know might be interested, uh, please, uh, I encourage you to take a look at our website. And if you are also interested, you can also contact me if you want uh, more informal information. Good. I also want to tell a little bit about my group. Uh, so <clears throat> my group has, uh, these days, has a core focus uh, looking at superconducting quantum circuits. Uh, that's sort of this little uh, circle in the middle. And then uh, using this technology, we look at two different topics. Uh, we look first, uh, where I started in this field is looking at mechanical systems. So we try to couple mechanical resonators to uh, gigahertz microwave circuits and use these gigahertz circuits to try to gain quantum control over the motion of mechanical objects. And the second uh, direction that I've been exploring more recently is looking at, uh, is playing around, let's say, in the world of circuit QED, where uh, by combining adjacent junctions and capacitors with inductors on chip, you can engineer quantum optics at microwave frequencies. And uh, that's also actually what I'll mainly be telling you about today. So some examples of the things we've done in recent years. Uh, so uh, we have some work uh, that I'll talk about today with this, uh, this idea of extending uh, circuit QED and quantum, uh, quantum circuits down to radio frequencies. Uh, we have some work, this uh, highlights a bit of our mechanical work where we've uh, looked at extremely coherent vibrations of uh, small membranes. Uh, we've also done some work looking at tunable couplers using uh, squids for, for in engineering tunable interactions between qubits. Uh, and uh, also, uh, this is something I'll also tell you about today, where we're looking at using uh, squids for uh, sensing of uh, radio frequency uh, photons and vibrations. Uh, I also want to quickly highlight for all of the work that we do, this quantum circuit work, uh, it's quite uh, involves a lot of quantum drawing circuits and understanding how to translate that into the Hamiltonian. We spend a lot of time doing that by hand, but I have a very I had a very talented PhD student, Mario, uh, who, uh, who actually decided that this uh, is a very time consuming and frustrating process. And so he wrote some software, which allows you to do this uh, automatically. So the software, you can draw a circuit of whatever kind of conduct uh, inductors, uh, capacitors, Josephson junctions, resistors, uh, you draw it together, you push a button and the software will automatically uh, output a Hamiltonian uh, for this that's, uh, that, uh, that uh, you can then uh, simulate in your quantum simulation software. And this is, uh, this is all analytic uh, and it's, it's a super handy tool. Um, so if you're interested in, in playing around in this field, uh, this is uh, maybe a nice, uh, I encourage you to take a look at this. So what I'll tell you about today, I'll work, I'll tell you, I'll try to get through two main topics. Uh, they'll be short actually, <laughs> uh, if I look at my timing. Uh, so I'll talk to you about circuit QED at radio frequencies. Uh, this is this, uh, this device here. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing by using squids uh, for quantum sensing of mechanics and uh, circuits at radio frequencies. So the first topic is this quantum RF. This is really uh, the, the lead on this project is my PhD student, Mario. Now, what's the idea? So uh, circuit QED, uh, which some of you may be familiar with is, is, is uh, at, 
is a field where one makes gigahertz artificial atoms on chip using uh, Josephson junctions and capacitors. And uh, also you make gigahertz uh, artificial photons on chips. Well, I don't know if they're artificial, but they're uh, magnetic and uh, electric fields that are quantized. Uh, at, and there are gigahertz frequencies. And then you put these together uh, and you try to engineer a coupling between them. And this actually mimics exactly the same coupling you have in cavity QED uh, between you know, actual atoms and, and photons in say an optical cavity. And the question that we wanted to ask is, uh, well, let's say uh, these gigahertz atoms are great for, for quantum control. We have, they're highly coherent. We can uh, program whatever quantum state we want and we can use that. Uh, people use that in this field with gigahertz photons to actually manipulate the state of the quantum state of photons. And we wanted to ask, let's say, can we bring this, these photons down to megahertz frequencies? So you might ask, why would we want to do that? Well, one, uh, one obvious uh, reason, well, one reason, uh, sort of a reason where we started in this direction is because we work with uh, also mechanical items, mechanical objects in the group, and they're typically much lower frequencies, for example, megahertz frequencies. And uh, if, we could, uh, if we could engineer, uh, if we could get quantum control over these megahertz photons, then we could engineer coupling to these megahertz mechanics and, and go towards this dream of getting quantum control uh, and building quantum superpositions of, of heavy macroscopic objects. But of course, there are also lots of other interesting things that happen in the radio frequency regime. And one example is that there's some very highly coherent uh, spin states, uh, which are very useful for, for quantum information in the megahertz regime. Uh, so one could imagine trying to yeah, use yeah, these, these quantum cooled photons to cool spin ensembles or, or, or build you know, program quantum states of these spin ensembles. Uh, yeah, also in this regime, even in our dilution refrigerators are in the regime of KT bigger than H bar omega. So you can start to think about playing quantum thermodynamics with, with actual like real thermod thermodynamic photons uh, in our dilution fridge. Uh, so these are some of the ideas that why, we, why this is interesting for us. Now the question is, uh, how do you do this? You know, you might think it's very easy. You just, okay, I just take my circuit QD and make my inductors a little bit bigger and my capacitors a little bit bigger and uh, I can pull this photon frequency down to megahertz. That's uh, what, we what we thought. It turns out that, uh, you know, you can do some very simple calculations using, for example, James Cummings model. Uh, and then you can say, yeah, it should work. Uh, the coupling, uh, even when you go down to very low frequencies, is fine. But it turns out that Mario, in the second month of his PhD, that's where we started, uh, he showed uh, analytically that actually, <laughs> if you include the counter-rotating terms of your Hamiltonian, which are usually neglected, uh, this uh, coupling completely disappears. <laughs> so that was a bit of a shock. And uh, we had to regroup and think about what we were going to do next. And that when we did that, this came up actually uh, after some brainstorming into this idea of this quantum RF circuit. So what's the idea? So the circuit that we're going to make is, uh, is actually going to look a bit funny because uh, it's basically just two inductors. Uh, it's the geometric inductor and it's Josephson inductor in series with a capacitor. And that is going to somehow contain both our photons uh, and our qubits. Uh, now, of course, and realize there's some parasitic capacitance of this inductor and some parasitic capacitance of this Josephson junction. So this is then sort of our photons over here, and this is our atom, and we're going to couple them together. But we're going to couple them together with a really, really big capacitor, like a gargantuan, huge capacitor. So, uh, so you know, uh, we can analyze this. You know, if we think about it, this is our photons and this is our atom then uh, we can actually analyze this uh, in terms of what we'll call bare modes, you know, imagining this capacitor was not there. Uh, and uh, uh, so this would be, for example, a 4.5 uh, gigahertz uh, photon and a 24 gigahertz uh, uh, atom. But when we put this huge capacitor in, actually the, you can analyze this in a James Cummings or quantum Rabi model, and you're gonna get a gargantuan uh, uh, coupling rate between them. In fact, the, the, the vacuum coupling rate of these atom and this, this, this atom and this cavity is, you know, in our device, 5.3 gigahertz, which is larger than the bare frequency of the photons themselves. So, uh, and actually we're at, this is really ultra, ultra strong coupling. And if you analyze it, uh, our, our experiment, we, it turns out in this bare mode, bare mode picture, we're at something like 99.9% .9 of the maximum theoretical limit 
for alter for, for the coupling strength uh, between uh, with these uh, transmon type qubits. So now, of course, uh, these are not uh, when you add this huge capacitor, these modes don't just uh, stick around, they get strongly renormalized. And what ends up happening is we end up with a 170 megahertz mode. When we look at the coupled modes, that's going to be our radio frequency photons and a 5.9 gigahertz mode, which is going to be our qubit like mode. So we had to go into clean them and make this. Uh, that involved developing some technology. So uh, this is a very unusual looking circuit QED device. Uh, uh, it's got this huge capacitor with this, with a parallel plate capacitor with a deposit of dielectric in between. Uh, it, yeah, we don't get super great uh, 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 quality factors. Of course, uh, the loss tangent of these dielectrics is typically 10 minus four, 10 minus five, uh, but that's good enough actually for this experiment. Uh, and um, so uh, we also needed a very large, in so that shows this capacitor, this is really 11 picofarads, uh, and that's that capacitor in the circuit I just showed at the beginning. Uh, we also needed a very large inductor, and so for that, uh, you know, usually in circuit QD, you use a couple planar waveguide, and that's a large enough inductance, but in this case, we really need a much, much larger inductance, and so we made this, uh, uh, we had to design and, and build the fabrication of this, uh, these tight spiral inductors to get the to get the inductance we needed for the circuit design. And also we needed to do a little bit funny things with our Joseph's injunction. We needed our Joseph's injunction to actually be have much larger uh, inductance than it typically does in a qubit. So that means we needed much lower critical currents. So we had to make this, uh, we had to optimize these junctions for low critical current. And also because of all the processing we needed to do, we need to protect this junction during the subsequent steps. So actually we ended up encapsulating it in this, the amorphous silicon we use for the capacitor dielectric. And that all uh, turned out that with some optimization, it worked. And this is what it looks like. Here you can then again see an electron microscope image of the capacitor, our Joe's junction uh, squid actually, and our spiral inductor. And actually we, uh, we, we don't even, we do direct readout of this circuit by just capacitively coupling it to a feed line, which we measure the reflection, uh, a microwave reflection measurements off of. So let's take a look if we, uh, at what we see if we do this reflection measurement. So what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, going to look at the reflection of this circuit up at frequencies where uh, this qubit mode is, and that's about 5.9 gigahertz. So there should be, uh, the qubit should have uh, you know, a little peak in, in our reflection uh, spectroscopy. And, uh, but actually, uh, so, uh, so we're going to send in our microwaves here. And later we're going to pump here as well, but for now we're just sending microwaves in and they're reflecting back. And then we're going to probe uh, the, this capacitance is small enough that it can only probe the qubit like mode of the circuit. And what we see actually is not just a single peak of, uh, so associated with our, our qubit, uh, our qubit device, our qubit mode, but in fact we see uh, this. So this is, uh, there's a whole bunch of peaks and the interpretation of this is that actually this is the the peak of this to say the the, the core the, the 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 usual transmit uh, uh, transition frequency of the qubit, but because this qubit is strongly coupled to these super far detuned uh, microwave uh, radio frequency uh, sir, uh, mode with these photons, actually we uh, and this this radio frequency mode at ten millikelvin even it's thermally occupied. And so, uh, so actually what we see is not just a single peak of our qubit, but uh, we actually see a, a photon number splitting of our qubit spectroscopy, uh, which allows us to directly observe and uh, quantify the number of photons in our radio frequency mode. And that's what you see here. So this is really directly observing as a quant the quantization of the radio frequency photons in our circuit. Uh, and actually this thermal occupation uh, is about 1.62. Uh, we can actually extract that uh, from directly from this fit. Uh, what's kind of interesting is actually our, our, our RF mode is, uh, is very cold. We can do thermometry by heating up the fridge and, uh, and calibrate this out. Our RF mode is actually very cold. Our qubit mode is very hot. And actually we think that that's related to the fact that the qubit is coupled to the outside world by the photons, by the feed line that we're using to probe the system. So, uh, so in addition, uh, what I, I briefly mentioned is that we can also pump the circuit so we can drive transitions in the circuit. And uh, 
this is kind of a very complicated drawing uh, of trying to explain uh, what we're going to do. So it turns out that uh, if we use uh, the nonlinearity of the of the Josephson junction in a circuit, we can actually uh, perform cooling of our radio frequency mode using four wave mixing transitions. And uh, sort of what we're going to do is we're going to drive uh, at a slightly detuned from the two photon transition of the of the of the qubit mode, and then that's going to scatter down. Uh, down to here into two photons, and then it's going to suck uh, two phonons or two uh, photons out of the radio frequency mode to match this uh, this resonance condition. Good. So uh, basically, uh, you can look at that in this dry diagram here. We can drive this transition like that, uh, and basically we're driving uh, we're driving the population out of this excited uh, state of the of the radio frequency photons up here. Uh, and then it decays down. And that's the basic cooling process. And you can see here, we start off uh, with uh, only a relatively small occupation uh, probability of occupying the ground state. But if we turn this on, then we can actually get up to 80% fidelity. Um, now, uh, it turns out that if we go uh, turn up the power more, uh, it doesn't uh, cool more. And that's because it turns out we're driving transitions way up out, out of this ladder by very high powers. Uh, but actually we can, because these are all spectrally resolved, we can put multiple tunes, you know, put multiple vacuum cleaners and suck more, uh, uh, all, all these transitions independently. And actually with that, we can, uh, we can uh, get down to 90% uh, uh, fidelity of the ground state. And what's uh, maybe super fun is that we can also turn one of these vacuum cleaners around and that actually stabilizes our our radio frequency mode into a Fox state and uh, uh, of our choice, depending on how many of these arrows we turn the other way. And so in this case, we can stabilize uh, the system, dynamically stabilize the system into a, a Fox state of one with a fidelity of 60%, and we can go to a fidelity of 35% for a Fox state of two. Good, so I'm gonna shift gears in the, in the very small amount of remaining time. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a totally different topic, the uh, totally different circuit, but also related to sen uh, uh, sensing uh, at radio frequencies. And this is going to be about radio, uh, sensing radio frequency vibrations and photons uh, and currents basically using squids. And the two people that have really taken the lead on this are Ines and Daniel uh, down here, uh, which has resulted in this nice uh, sequence of papers uh, with more in the pipeline. So what is the basic idea? So, uh, well, what is a squid? So a squid is actually uh, a loop of superconducting metal, which is separated by two of these Josephson junctions. And, uh, and the basic idea is that uh, the because this electron wave function is coherent across all of these pieces of superconductor, you actually get an Aronov Bohm interference of the quantum uh, of the uh, of the supercurrent, sort of a quantum interference of the two-path interference of the supercurrent uh, as it flows from one side to the other, and uh, that gives you actually uh, oscillations of the critical current of this you know squid as a function of the flux through the loop. So actually, this is, this is, these are super, super sensitive things. Uh, so for example, a 10 by 10 micron loop, which is already pretty small, uh, means that this oscillation from uh, of the supercurrent occurs at a field of 20 micro Tesla. And for that reason, people use it for crazy things like hanging off helicopters and looking for oil or uh, sensing magnetic fields uh, from your brain. So, uh, but we're going to do, uh, we're going to use, um, at least for a different way. And we're going to also measure them in a particular way. And uh, we're going to make something called a squid cavity. So to understand what a squid cavity is, maybe it's good to, uh, to, uh, to uh, mention that the, if I put uh, the, the, what these Josephson junctions do in a circuit, if I put this a Josephson junction in a circuit with a capacitor, it turns out that this Josephson junction looks like an inductor. Uh, it has an inductance called the Joseph's inductance that's inversely proportional with critical current. So if I just put this junction here with a capacitor, I have actually a cavity. And that's basically what we do in the group. We design cavities in the microwave frequency regime. So uh, now if I put two of these in a loop, because the critical current depends on magnetic field, then these uh, then I actually tune this the frequency of this cavity uh, with magnetic field. 
And actually the whole idea of sensing with squid cavities is that if I have this very, if I can get to this point where I have a very st steep slope and my cavity has a very high Q, then the idea is that we can use this to do sensing down to, uh, you know, in principle to the quantum level. Uh, and that's the idea of what we want to do with, uh, with these circuits. So uh, I want to show two examples of what we've done with this sort of sensing, uh, quantum sensing with squids. And the first is uh, related to the mechanical work that we do in the group. And here the idea is that we, uh, if we make part of our squid uh, bounce and vibrate, then uh, if we put it in plane field or a field, you, typically we put it in plane field, uh, then as this thing bounces up and down, that's going to actually encapsulate a little bit of the, the field, the flux is going to capture a little bit of flux from this field penetrating this, uh, this perpendicular area here. And, and that actually is a way to translate the displacements that we want to measure into flux. Uh, and once we have this flux, we can use our squid cavities to, 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 to sense it with high uh, sensitivity. And what's nice is that the sensitivity to position is actually linearly proportional to the external field. So in principle, we just keep turning up the external field and turn it up and turn it up. We can get, get this thing to be more and more and more and more and more sensitive in, in principle to the superconductor uh, dice. And that's actually what we've been working on. So this is, uh, this is what we uh, came up with as a device. It's basically, uh, this is a squid down here. Uh, you can see it's uh, schematically illustrated. This little dark area is where it's suspended. I'll show some pictures in a minute. We have some, uh, we have actually a small series inductor uh, uh, and then uh, this huge capacitor to ground and that's coupled to a transmission line that we measure uh, the, the squid cavity with. This is what it looks like. This is a, a very thin layer of aluminum silicon, uh, which we've under etched with an optimized SF6 uh, 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 well, hmm, fluorine plasma process. And actually the junctions we use are a bit unconventional as well. Uh, we wanted larger critical current junctions. And so we've made these very small uh, nano, 2D nano bridge junctions in this device. So this uh, shows you uh, the basic idea. So this is a flux because of these uh, of the squid loop, we can actually we have a cavity, a, a, free, a you know, microwave frequency cavity, who's tuned by flux, and the idea is that if we put it in plane field, this cavity is also tuned by uh, motion, and that's the that's how we're going to sense the motion. So I will just show uh, quickly a couple of plots. So the basic idea is that if uh, if we're uh, so this is here, I'm going to show you data of what's called the single photon coupling rate, which is a, a measure of the sensitivity of our device to, to, the, to the motion of the, of the beam. And uh, now the basic idea, of course, of this flux, of this flux coupling is that the steeper the slope is, the stronger the coupling is. And so you can see here, this is actually us changing one way to change uh, the, uh, well, the basic way you change the, the steepness of the slope is that you can adjust where you are in this flux oscillation periodicity and the steeper the slope is, the larger the coupling. And that's exactly what we see. Um, but the, the real, uh, from our perspective, the real exciting bit is turning up the field and, uh, and actually we can turn up the field. Uh, we did the same thing. We picked two different points of this flux tuning curve. This is super tricky to keep everything all stabilized, uh, but uh, the students did a lot of hard work to do that. And then we can sweep this field and we see that the coupling also increases. And that confirms exactly what uh, we thought. Uh, so that really confirms that we've actually built this flux, uh, uh, the squid cavity for sensing mechanics. And actually we have a new generation device. Uh, uh, this is actually using three uh, slightly, slightly different Josen junction. And this device we've actually recently cooled using four wave weird four wave mixing and on the area of the squid down to 1.3 phonons. So last topic I want to try to go through very quickly is uh, another idea that we've been exploring with these squid cavities. And that's using the squid cavities as a as a quantum galvanometer, and basically we're going to try to sense quantum quantum currents uh, using these squid cavities. The idea is actually very similar to the to the previous section, but now instead of having a flux that is produced by vibrations of a beam, we're going to have a flux that is produced by oscillating currents in a circuit, and we're going to use them the mutual inductance between say a low frequency circuit resonator over here and the high frequency cavity over here uh, to have the currents of this circuit induce flux in this uh, 
in this loop and that flux in that loop tunes the frequency of uh, the high frequency cavity. So we can use a high, the frequency of the high cavity, frequency of the high frequency cavity, the squid cavity to sense the, the currents in this, in this low frequency cavity. And in principle, if we do this in the right way and we do this carefully, we can actually use this to sense uh, yeah, the quantum fluctuate, yeah, not only the say currents that we excite in this cavity, but even the quantum fluctuations of the of the low frequency cavity. So uh, to show that this works, this is uh, uh, what we did is uh, you can. This is actually implements optimal mechanics, so we can uh, do some fun uh, optimal mechanics uh, experiments. This is of optimal mechanical sensing of, of, of currents using a squid cavity. <laughs> um, uh, but let's say uh, these show here uh, 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 some measurements of what we call what is what would be called optimal mechanically induced transparency and normal mode splitting uh, between the the high frequency cavity and the low frequency cavity. And uh, here, and that means we, I could, in this device, we get to quite high cooperativities, uh, around 50, which actually should be more than enough to ground state cool. Uh, we, also, uh, we also looked at uh, the, uh, we could also sense the, the, the thermal fluctuations in this, ex, in this first experiment, and this shows uh, us detecting the thermal fluctuations, the RF thermal noise of the low frequency cavity down to 15 millikelvin using the squid cavity. And uh, maybe I'll give a little teaser. We have a new device where we optimize things a bit more, maximize the mutual inductance. And actually this device, we were able to cool the user's squid cavity to actually cool the radio frequency mode uh, down into the quantum ground state. So as a summary, uh, I've told you about uh, our first one experiment where we've used circuit QED to implement uh, photonics at radio frequencies and directly observed uh, the, the quantization of radio frequency electromagnetic fields. And I've told you about uh, a, a sequence of experiments we've done uh, where we've started to use uh, squid cavities uh, for uh, quantum sensing of radio uh, frequency magnetic fields. And the outlook of where we want to go in the future is uh, is to look at using these uh, for quantum sensing and, and coupling to hybrid uh, quantum systems at radio frequencies. So uh, I want to end quickly uh, by thanking the people. So this is uh, Daniel Ines. Uh, this is a group photo from uh, some some years ago, uh, and these are the Daniel Ines who were involved in the uh, in the, the squid sensing, and this is Mario uh, Marios and Mark, who were three of the authors in uh, the. Uh, circuit QED paper. Uh, so I will end that now then. Uh, I will end my presentation now and I'll thank you for your attention and I will uh, mention I will be monitoring the forum and I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions or discuss uh, if anyone is interested to learn more about this work. Thank you.